Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and we praise you for your word, which is the truth. We receive it, written in our heart, written in our mind this day. We thank you for the revelation of it. We will walk in the light of it, in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. Today we're going to share with you on the subject of understanding spiritual authority. Every one of us must understand spiritual authority in our life. We see in the very beginning, when God made man, and he set him in the garden, in Genesis 1.26, he said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Man was given dominion. He was in a position of authority. We see the fact that God retained control in heaven, as it says, but the earth he gave into the hands of the children of men. We see this down in Psalms 115 in verse 16, where he says, The heaven, even the heavens, are the Lord's, but the earth has he given to the children of men. The earth was given to the children of men. And it was the responsibility of man to guard the earth and not to let any evil intruders come in. Well, unfortunately, in Genesis chapter 3, in verse 6, after God had told man that he was not to partake of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he made a big mistake. And we see in Genesis 3, 6, the woman who was deceived, but the man was not, as it says in 1 Timothy 2, 14, the woman saw the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. And she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. He knew what he was doing. He disobeyed. In doing so, he rebelled against God, and he transferred that authority that was given unto him into the hands of Satan. At that time, we see from Ephesians chapter 2, in verse 2, Satan became the ruler over the authority of the air. It says in Ephesians 2, 2, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince. Prince means ruler of the power. This word is exousia, which means authority. For you are here for the first time. We put the cursor over particular words, and in the lower window, show you the meanings. This means ruler of the authority of the air. The spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. Satan became the one who was the ruler. We know from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, over in verse 4, it speaks of him as the God of this world. He is the God of this world system because of the fact that it was given into him, into his hands. And we know even when Jesus was being tempted over in Luke chapter 4, Luke chapter 4, verse 6, in the midst of the temptations, the devil said to him, all this power, again this word exousia, which means authority, will I give thee, and the glory of that, for it's delivered unto me, and whomsoever I will, I give it. Jesus didn't dispute that whatsoever, because that was the truth. Of course, the temptation was, if you just fall down and worship me, I'll be thine, that was the lie. But the truth was, the authority had been given into Satan's hand. He is the God of this world, the one who's been the ruler of the authority of the air. And because of that, man became under Satan's dominion. He's now as a spiritual father of mankind, as we see over in John chapter 8, verse 44. It speaks of him. When he spoke to the religious people of the day, he said, You are of your father, the devil their spiritual father, the devil. And the lust of your father, you will do. That's why everybody has to get born again, receiving Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior. Now, Satan now was ruling over the earth, and he brought sickness, he brought disease, he brought poverty, he brought war, he brought all kinds of destruction, he brought death, all types of calamities. But God had a plan, and the plan that he was going to bring forth redemption. And in order to accomplish this redemption, God had to do it because man was already under Satan's dominion, <clears throat> so God had to become a man. <clears throat> and that's Jesus, the Word, was made flesh and came and dwelled among us, tabernacled among us. And he came in order to accomplish the redemption. Everything that Jesus did was directed by the Father, and he came to accomplish the redemption. We see in John chapter 8, 
10, verse 18, Jesus said, No man taketh it from me, but I lay down of myself, talking about his life. I have power. Again, this is the word exousia, which means authority. Young's corrects the error. The word for power in the Greek is dunamis, that means power. Exousia means authority. I have authority to lay it down, and I have, same word, authority to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Jesus did everything from the position of being submitted unto the Father, and all the authority was given unto him from the Father to carry things out. We see over in John 17, in verse 2, he said, As thou hast given him authority again over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. He was given authority over all man. And for those who would receive him and would walk in the ways of the Lord, of course, he's going to give eternal life to them. Jesus also came, and he was also given authority to execute judgment. He came in his first coming, not to judge, but to bring salvation. But in his second coming, he's going to come as a judge, and he's going to bring judgment. He's given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Jesus did everything from the position of authority. As he went forth, he taught the Word of God. And he taught with authority every where it was he went forth. Matthew chapter 7. We see down here in verse 29, it says, For he taught them as one having authority. Again, this is this word exousia. Here the King James translated it correctly. Most of the places they don't most of the time. And not as the scribes. Jesus had authority from heaven. And he came to teach the truth of the word of God. He had authority in the earth. We also see over in Luke chapter 5, in verse 20. Luke chapter 5. Verse 20, it says here, when he saw this man's faith, the faith of those four that were coming down through the tile of the roof, he said to a man, thy sins are forgiven thee, which means really to send away from you. He sent away the sins from him. Of course, they couldn't understand that one. They said, who is this that speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive or send away sins but God alone? Jesus, of course, says, whichever is easier to say, thy sins be sent away from thee, or to say, rise up and walk. But you may know that the Son of Man has authority again upon earth to send forth sins. He said unto the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, arise, take up thy couch, and go unto thine house. And immediately he rose up before them and took up that whereupon he, whereon he lay and departed to his own house, glorifying God. He operated in authority. He had authority to remit sins. He had authority to heal the sick and to do the mighty works. He had authority, of course, over all evil spirits. In Mark chapter 1, in verse 23, there was in a synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out. And it said, the demon speaking through him, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. The demons recognized who he was. Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. The unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice. He came out of him. And they were all amazed, insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority, exousia, commanded the, even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. Jesus operated from the position of authority. That's what you and I are going to operate, the same position. We must understand spiritual authority. They came and asked him, they said, well, what, what authority are you operating under? Who gave you this authority? Matthew 21, 23, he came into the temple. Chief priests, elders of the people came to him as he was teaching. He said, by what authority doest thou these things? And who gave you this authority? It was the Father that gave him the authority. He operated under the authority of the Father, doing everything that the Father told him to do. We see over in John, Chapter 5, in verse 30, Jesus makes this statement. I can of mine own self do nothing. Jesus didn't do anything of himself. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father that hath sent me. That's a key if you're going to operate in authority. You can't be doing something yourself. 
and you can't be doing whatever you want. You're going to seek the will of the Father, and you're going to do His will. You're going to do what the Word of God says and be obedient. It's exactly what Jesus did. In John chapter 8, down in verse 29, He makes the statement, He that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please Him. That's where God wants to bring you and I to, that we always do the things that please the Father. We're always going to walk in His ways. We're going to be obedient to Him in all things. Jesus came to do all that the Father told Him to do. He's our model of all the th showing what you and I are to walk after. And He came to destroy all the works of the enemy. We know in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8, speaks, For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that He might destroy the works of the devil. And that's exactly what he did. He destroyed the works of the devil every place he went. But as he was doing this, he began to raise up disciples. And the disciples, he gave them authority. It says, when he called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them exousia, authority against unclean spirits, to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. That means they went forth and operated in the same authority that he gave unto them. He delegated that authority to them. And he cast, they cast out the demons. They healed the sick. They saw people being set free. Over in Luke, in chapter 10, then he appointed 70 also. The Lord appointed other 70, sent them two by two before his face into every city, every place he went. And they were given the same authority and they went forth and were to heal the sick that are in and say the kingdom of God, the rule and reign of God has come nigh unto you. Not only were they healing the sick, but they were casting out the demons because they came back in verse 17, the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. They did everything that he told them to do. Of course, he told them in verse 20, he said, Notwithstanding this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. That's the only reason you can operate in authority, because your names are written in heaven and you are right with the Father. We must understand that God wants you and I to walk in this authority. This word author, ex, exousia is a word which refers to the right to rule, spiritual jurisdiction. It means having authority to rule and reign over enemies. And you and I can rule and reign over all of our enemies. Exousia actually means X means out of, and usia is the word to be. It literally means to be out of yourself, or to go beyond yourself, the right to go beyond yourself. Because you realize the fact that you don't have the authority in yourself. It's a delegated authority. Jesus was operating not from his authority, from the Father gave him the authority. It was delegated from him and he operated in it. You and I are going to do the same thing. Authority has been given, delegated to us. It's the right to go beyond yourself. That's why you do everything in the name of Jesus. If you think for a minute that you're doing things in your authority or ability, you're kidding yourself. You're deceived. Pride gets a hold of you. You're doing nothing by your own ability or your own power or authority. It's all by God's authority and power that is operating. He's given believers the authority today to go forth and do the mighty works of God. Mark 16, over in verse 15. He says to go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Every one of us are to be used of the Lord to preach the gospel. He wants to use you to share the word of God with others. And we come down to verse 17, and it says, These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. So this just wasn't for those disciples and the 12 and the 70 in the Old Testament, it's also for us today, believers. Every believer is to cast out the demons, speak with new tongues, and go to, if they take any serpents, which is a type of, if they've taken up anything that is of evil, evil spirits, drink any deadly thing that shall not hurt them, that they, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover, bringing healing to people. So the Lord has spoken to them, he received up to heaven, sat on the right hand of God, and then what'd they do? They went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming the word with signs following. That's for every single one of us. God wants every one of us to cast out demons, to heal the sick, to do the mighty works of the Lord. 
How are we going to do it? We're going to do it through authority. We must understand that Jesus came to accomplish the redemption. And the way he accomplished the redemption is he had to go through the avenue of death. Hebrews 2.14 says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself also likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. He went through that avenue to get to him and destroy him that had the power of death. And Jesus took back the keys of hell and of death. He took it back. We know that when Jesus was going to be taken to the cross, Pilate made a statement to him. John chapter 19 and verse 9. This is where he said, where, where, Pilate saying to Jesus, Whence art thou? Where you come from? Jesus gave him no answer. In verse 10, Pilate said to him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest not that I have authority, same word, exousia, to crucify thee, and I have authority to release thee. He thought he had authority. Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no authority at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore, he that delivered me unto thee hath a greater sin. Authority comes from the Father. He's the one that has it. At the same time, remember that Satan had a kingdom as the God of this world. And he had an authority of darkness that was operating. And Jesus gave himself into the hands of the devil. He gave himself into his authority. It says so in Luke 22, 53. I was daily with you in this temple. You stretched no hands, forth no hands against me. But this is your hour and the authority of darkness. He allowed Satan's authority over him for the purpose of going through death in order to accomplish the redemption. You see, he never sinned, so there's no reason that he should have been taken. But he gave himself because he was made sin with our sins in order to go through that avenue of death to accomplish the redemption it was a mistake. And he took back the keys of hell and death, as it says in Revelation chapter 1, verse 18. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. He took it back from Satan. He got those keys after he was born from the dead, the Jesus being the firstborn from the dead. And when Jesus came up out from being down in hell, after taking back the keys of hell and death, he makes this statement in Matthew 28, 18. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All authority, again the word, exousia, is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And then he took back the authority that Satan had over the earth. You know, up to that time, in the Old Testament era, there were all these different kingdoms that Satan had operating. He had the Egyptians, and he had the Assyrians, and he had the, the Greeks, and he had the Romans. He had all these different kingdoms that were operating through there. But well, since Jesus came on the scene, there's never really ever been. The Romans, of course, at the time of the end, but and nobody's been, and they haven't seen any great worldly kingdoms. But there will be one near the end as the, here, as the Antichrist is going to come on the scene to try to bring forth his kingdom, but he's, of course, going to be destroyed at the end. Jesus took back the authority over the earth. And when Jesus went to heaven, he was then enthroned as the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and he was given the scepter of righteousness, the scepter of his kingdom, and he began to rule and to reign. Now Jesus is in that position as we see in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20 and following. Speaking of him being raised from the dead, the Father set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all, principality and authority, again, this word means authority, and might and dominion, every name that's named, not only in the world, this world, but also in that which is to come. And he has put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. Jesus now has been given this authority to rule and to reign as the head over the church. Everything is subject now unto him. 1 Peter chapter 3, over in verse 22, he says, speaking of Jesus, who's gone into heaven, is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. They're all subject unto him. 
Well, what happens to us? The day that you receive Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior and you get born again, when you receive Jesus, something happens. You get a brand new spirit. You get the spirit of Jesus Christ. And what does that do for you? As many as received him, John 1, 12, to them gave he the authority, same word, exousia, the authority to become the sons, or really this means the children of God, even to them that believe on his name. You now have given the authority to become the sons of God as you receive Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior. And what has happened to us? Now that we've got a brand new spirit on the inside, we've heard the gospel, we've seen a change come on the inside of us. Acts 26, 18 speaks of the gospel, what it does. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, from the authority, exousia, of Satan unto God. They may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that's in me. You and I have been turned from darkness to light. We've come out of the authority of Satan, and now we have come into relationship with God, and we're under His authority. Over in Colossians, the Bible declares in chapter 1, verse 13, speaking of what He's done for us, who has delivered us from the exousia, authority. Again, the King James most of the time translates it power erroneously. The authority of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. You're not under authority of darkness any longer. You're in the kingdom. You're in the position to rule and reign in Jesus Christ. The Bible even talks about that we've become priests unto God, and there's a twofold priesthood, as we see. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5 speaks of the holy priesthood. We're now we are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, offering up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. We now can come in the very presence of God and minister unto Him and have fellowship with Him. But in verse 9 it says, You're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. That's a kingly priesthood that's to rule and to reign. You've been called out of darkness into the marvelous light now, and you are to rule and reign. In fact, we see in Revelation chapter 1, over in verse 6, where it says, He's made us kings and priests unto God. You're a king. You're in a position in the kingdom to rule and to reign. Kings have been given authority. God has made you a king. He's put you in that position to rule and to reign under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Of course, you've got to be submitted to Him. This authority has been delegated to you that you can go beyond yourself and operate in the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians 2.10, you are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and all authority. Again, the word, what it means. In Christ, now you are under His headship, and you are to be submissive unto the Lord. This is why James chapter 4, verse 17 tells us, before we're going to operate in authority, James 4, 7, he says, submit yourselves therefore to God. If you're going to operate in authority, you have to submit yourself to God first. You have to understand spiritual authority. You can't just operate it however you want, whenever you want, and do whatever you want to do. It doesn't work that way. You've got to be submitted unto God. Then you're in a position of authority so you can resist the devil in this case, and he will flee from you. But you must be submitted unto the Lord. We see a case over in Matthew, Matthew chapter 8. In Matthew chapter 8, here was the man, a centurion. We see in verse 5, Jesus entered into Capernaum. There came a centurion. He was beseeching him. And this guy says, Lord, my servant lieth at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. He recognized Jesus was operating in authority. Jesus said to him, I'll come and heal him. And the centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. He was a centurion. But speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. He recognized not only that Jesus was operating in authority, he understood how he operated. He spoke commanding words that released that authority that accomplished great mighty works. 
in this case, healing. He says, for I'm a man under authority. That's a key statement. He says, I understand how authority works. I'm under authority. Who was he under authority? He was under authority to Caesar in Rome. So having soldiers under me, and because of that, then he had others that were under him. He had to be under authority to those above before he'd be under author over, in authority over those who were under him. I say to this man, go and he goeth to another, come and he cometh to my servant, do this and he doeth it. He spoke commanding words. He understood how authority works. You've got to understand how authority works. You speak commanding words that releases authority. He understood this. I tell him to go, they go. I tell them to come, they come. I tell them to do this, they do it. That's what God wants. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, I verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Great faith is shown in when you understand authority and you understand how it works, that you speak commanding words and you know that when you speak commanding words that it's going to be obeyed. It's going to be accomplished. That was great faith. You are to operate in that same faith. You are to operate in authority that's been delegated unto you. And you are to rise up and walk in this authority. At the same time, we've got to be submitted unto the Lord. We've got to walk in His ways. We can't just do whatever He wants, wherever we want. Titus chapter 3, over in verse 1. He says, Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and authorities, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. You and I must be submitted to authorities. You can't just do whatever you want. You can't break the laws. You can't be walking contrary to authority that's set, whether it's spiritual law or whether it's natural law. You've got to walk in these ways and be obedient to it. We see over in Romans, in chapter 13, he says, Let every soul, and be all of us, be subject unto the higher authorities. There is no authority but of God. God's the one who gives authority. The authorities that be are ordained of God. Authorities are set. Whoso therefore resisteth the authority, he resists the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation, which means judgment. That's why you and I have to follow the law. If you don't follow the laws, you don't follow what's right, you're going to have judgment come upon you. We're resisting what is right. God wants you to obey authority, authority and do what he says. That means we've got to obey authority of the laws. We also have to obey spiritual law, being obedient in all the things that God tells us to do. He goes on and says in verse 3, Rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Will thou then not be afraid of the authority? Again, exousia. Do that which is good, and you'll have praise of the same. No problems. He's a minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. He's the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon them that doeth evil. We're going to see judgments, aren't we, if we do evil. God expects you and I to obey the laws. He expects us to obey spiritual laws as well. It is so important. You must understand regarding yourself, God has authority over you. And in Romans chapter 9, verse 21, you see, you've come into relationship with him. You've been born again. You were under Satan's authority, but not any longer. Now you're under his authority, and he has authority over you. Romans 9, 21, hath not the potter authority, exousia, over the clay? Or the clay, he's the potter, of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor. God will make one vessel honor one vessel, dishonor. Does that mean that God is just arbitrarily doing this to whoever he decides? I'll make you a vessel of honor, make you a vessel of dishonor, and so forth? No, but he is going to produce everything, something else. Because God's the one who's doing the work. And we, of course, have a part to play in this, though, because it's not just God arbitrarily doing this. How do we know? Because over in 2 Timothy, in chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2, we see over in verse 19. He says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure, having the seal. The Lord knoweth them that are His. That's the ones that are really walking His ways. 
And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Iniquity is a Greek word, autokia, which means unrighteousness. You and I, if we name the name of Christ, we've got to depart from unrighteousness. We can't walk in the ways of unrighteousness, which is sin, and think we're going to be right with God. That's why you must conquer all sin in your life. Sin has no dominion over you. You're dead to sin now. You're alive unto God. The Lord knows those that are His. Who are the ones that are His? The ones that have departed from unrighteousness. And then he comes down and he says, A great house, there's not only vessels of gold and of silver, and also of wood and earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. And remember, he's the potter over the clay. He makes some to honor and some to dishonor. Well, how does God do this work? It's through the Word in you. It's what he's going to make. Now, if the Word's not in you, you're going to end up being a vessel of dishonor. But does this mean that God just can automatically make you a vessel of honor however he wants? No. You have a part to play in it. Because the next verse goes on and says, If a man therefore purge or cleanse out thoroughly himself from these, from what? All the unrighteousness, all the sin, all the things that are not of him, he shall be a vessel unto honor. So, what you do with the Word, what you do as far as cleansing yourself and purging yourself and getting rid of all the things that are not of God is all going to determine what God's going to make of you. Because He's doing the work, remember, through the Word in you. You'll be a vessel unto honor. You'll be sanctified. You'll be meat for the Master's use. You'll be prepared unto every good work. God will make this all in you. You'll be sanctified. You'll be set apart in Him. You'll be holy. God's commanded us to be holy as He is holy and able to be used of the Lord. Notice, you need to be a vessel of honor and sanctified before you're really going to be used much of the Lord. And He wants you prepared unto every good work because God wants you and I to go forth and carry out the works of the Lord because He's not only come to do a work in us, but He also wants to do a work through us. So you and I are going to go forth and do the works of the Lord. Therefore, You've got to be sure that you submit yourself to God and walk in His ways, conquer sin in your life, go through the cleansing process, be submissive totally to Him, put His Word first place, be one who's under authority, so you, and then you also understand how authority works by speaking commanding words, then you can be able to operate in authority. We also see a scripture over in Luke, chapter 12. In Luke chapter 12, we see down here in verse 5, he says, I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. This is where he said back in verse 4, Be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do that can't do anything more to you. I will forewarn you, whom, forewarn you whom you shall fear. The fear of God is to be before us. Fear him, that's God, which after he hath killed, you having been killed is Fear him who, after the killing, talking about if your body was killed, that's really what it means in the Greek, Young's brings out, has authority, exousia again, to cast into hell. That's right. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Is it God's will for anybody to be cast into hell? No. Who, who would determine it would be our choice? Because remember, if we choose the right way, then, of course, we're going to be right with the Lord. But if we choose the wrong way, and we don't walk in His ways, what's going to happen? We can be cast into hell. That's why it says, fear Him. God wants the fear of God on you, in your life. Philippians chapter 2 tells us we are to have the fear of God before us and what we're supposed to be doing. Philippians 2.12 says, Beloved, wherefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, obedience, obedience to the Word, that means you're submissive, submissive to authority. Obedience. As you've always obeyed, not just once in a while, God wants you to always obey authority, the Word of God. Not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Again, you and I have a part, big part to play in this. God accomplishes the work, but He can't do it unless you and I do what He says. Work out is a Greek word here which refers to something that's going to be an ongoing process in your life. You're going to continually be doing this because this is a present tense verb, which means continuous ongoing action. You're going to be continually working out your own salvation. And notice, this is an imperative mood. 
For you who are here for the first time, we can show tense, voice, and mood of verbs, which is very important to see what's being said. You, are, you and I are commanded to continually work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, the fear of the Lord, because we realize God is the one who is in authority. He is the one who is the God. God Jesus has the authority. It's been given unto him. He wants nobody to perish. He wants all to come to the truth and be saved. But what happens for those who will not walk in the way of the Lord? They're going to be in trouble. Of course, when you're working out your own salvation with fear and trouble, you say, well, is God doing this work in me? You better believe it as you're doing the word. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. As you're hearing and doing the word, God's working in you because he is the word. That's why hearing the word and doing the word is the key. As the word is in you, we talked about having the word in your heart in the last time we were together on Wednesday. Having the word in your heart and activated, operating your life is essential if you're going to see God accomplish what he purposes. Of course, that's why the devil comes to try to take the word out so the word will not produce fruit in your life. God's at work in you to will and to do of his good pleasure, and he wants to accomplish it. You are to be submissive to the Lord and under his authority. You're not to allow yourself to come under any authority that's contrary to what God would want you to do. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. He said, all things are lawful unto me, and all things are not, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the authority of any. Otherwise, I'm not going to be brought under the authority of anything that, it might be okay, the world says it's okay, but it's not right. You've got to do what's right in the sight of the Lord. What God says to do, you and I must do. We cannot follow contrary to anything that's contrary to his word. We become lawless. Lawless. We cannot allow any lawlessness to get a hold of us. We must be submissive unto him. Now, regarding being able to make these choices, are we robots? No. God's given you a free will. We see in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 37, speaking of the guy who is keeping control of his flesh so he doesn't fall into sexual sin, he says, Nevertheless, he that standeth steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, has Exousia, ex again, authority over his own will, as Young, of course, brings this out. See, if you have a King James Version, you don't look at these things up, you'll never figure out what to say in it whatsoever. That's why you've got to look words up. The major problems in the King James Version, because they didn't translate things accurately. Has authority over his own will, and is so decreed in his heart that he will keep his virgin, he doeth well. You have authority over your own will. You can make choices. God has set before you, as we even see back even in the Old Testament where it says in Deuteronomy chapter 30, Deuteronomy 30, down in verse 19, he makes this statement. He says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live. You have authority over your own will. God's not going to make you do anything. You're going to choose to be obedient, to do the things that he wants you to do. In fact, what's God know about you? He wants to find out whether you're going to walk in his ways or not. And he'll find out whether or not you, obey, by the way, you, whether you obey or not. 2 Corinthians 2.9, he says, For to this end also did I write that I might know the proof of you. What's the proof of you? Whether you be obedient in all things. Someone who is obedient in all things, that means they're under authority. They're submissive to authority. They're submissive to the Word. They make sure that they walk in line with the Word at all times. They're under authority. And remember, when you're under authority, then you're going to be able to operate in authority. Can you operate in authority if you're not under authority? No. That's rebellion. We can't be rebellious. We can't do the things we want to do. This is why you've got to know that you're bought with a price, you belong to the Lord, you're not your own. In fact, we see a principle shown in Isaiah 65, verse 2, where he said to them, I spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people. Who was rebellious? The ones that wouldn't walk in his ways and do what he said, weren't submissive to him. Which walketh a way that was not good. What was not good? After their own thoughts. 
Remember, he says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. We've got to get our mind renewed to the truth so we get the mind of Christ through the Word in us so our thoughts will be his thoughts. We cannot walk in a way after our own thoughts or, he says, we are rebellious. God wants you and I to choose the way of the Lord. You've got authority over your own will. And you can never say, the devil made me do it. The devil influenced you, but you had to yield to him and choose. You can never blame the things on the devil. Yes, he has power and he works against people and works to drive them to do things, but you have the choice. Remember the man from Gadara? He was so bound, he running around with no clothes. He had such power from the demons in him. He broke the chains. He was off in the tombs. He was out, totally out of his mind. Yet when he heard of Jesus, he ran to him and fell down and worshipped him. If that guy, as bad off as he was, could run and fall down and worship Jesus, so can you and I. We can choose the way of the Lord. God wants you to choose the things that please him. He wants you to choose the way of the Lord. He wants you to choose to be submissive unto him, obedient in all things, and under authority. Many Christians want to operate in authority. Oh, i got authority over the devil. And yet they're not submissive to God. That's a mistake. You need to be submissive unto God if you're going to operate in the authority that he wants you to operate in. Mark chapter 13. We see in verse 34. The Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house. Who's his house? The house is the church. Jesus is the cornerstone, the cornerstone of the church. You and I are lively stones in the house of the Lord. So he left his house, which means he went back to heaven. He left. And he gave authority to his servants. That's you and me. Here they translate it correctly. And to every man his work commanded the porter to watch. He's watching. He's watching you and me to see what are we doing with the authority that he's given to us. Are we using that authority to do the things he wants? Are we working out our own salvation? Are we seeing God accomplish his work in us? Are we being used of the Lord to let him be a servant for him so we can accomplish the work through us? He's given everyone his authority. He's given every man his work. You've got a work to do. We're to work out our own salvation, and we're also to do the works of the Lord. God expects us to do things. See, God has given you authority over all the power of the enemy. You must realize when you come to the place of being under authority, you start operating authority, no work of the devil will be able to be, be staying oper operative and controlling you in your life. You can destroy every work of the devil. It means you can be set free from every bondage in your life. Luke 10, 19. Behold, I give unto you, King James says, power to tread on serpents, scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Again, you've got to look up words to see if they're translated correctly. The first word, power, exousia, means authority. Second word, power, is truly the word for power, which is dunamis, which means power. Young's, again, corrects the error. God has given us authority to tread on serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy. And notice the word power of the enemy is the word dunamis, the same word for the power of God. The enemy has power. But you're going to use authority to stop the power of the enemy. It goes on and says, nothing shall by any means hurt you. Unfortunately, there have been many Christians today that make this a confession and just say, they're just going to say this. God's given me authority to tread on serpents, scorpions over all the power of the enemy. Nothing shall by any means hurt me. Because I said it, that means automatically nothing can hurt me. And they wonder why they're getting beat up left and right by the devil. It's because that's not a confession statement that we're to make. How do you know? Because again, you've got to look up the verbs and find out what's being said. When it says, nothing shall by any means hurt you, I put the cursor over this word, hurt. And we can look up these tense voice and mood here. We find that this is a subjunctive mood. There are seven tenses, three voices, and five moods in the Greek. This particular mood is significant because it's the subjunctive mood. Whenever you see a subjunctive mood verb in the Greek, it is expressing things that are contrary to fact, that are conditional upon conditions being met. Otherwise, it's not a statement of fact that's a truth. 
Nothing shall by any means hurt me if I just confess that. No, it is a something that is conditional upon conditions being met. It means nothing will hurt me if the conditions are met. Well, what's the condition? I have to use the authority to stop the power of the enemy. If you don't put your authority into operation to stop the power of the enemy, you're going to get hurt left and right. And you wonder, why is this happening? Is God allowing this? No, you're allowing it because we're not doing what he says. He's given us authority. It's a delegated authority. And we go beyond ourselves. We're out of ourselves. And don't ever think it's you. You're just simply operating to release his authority through you. And that's why you do everything in the name of Jesus. You and I have authority over all the power of the enemy. That means you can stop every work of the devil. We need to understand spiritual authority. But we've got to be under spiritual authority. Many people aren't operating in authority as they should because they really aren't under spiritual authority themselves. We've got to understand it. We've got to also understand how it works. We make commanding statements, commanding words. We speak commanding words. And we're going to go forth and do the things that God wants us to do. In fact, God has given you authority over all the evil spirits operating in the heavenlies. In Ephesians chapter 6, when it talks about how we put on the armor of God to stand against the wiles of the devil, it tells us in verse 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, that's against people, people's not our problem, but against principalities and authorities, the word powers really means authorities, exousia, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. These are evil spirits that are operating. Satan's evil spirits are still operating at this time. And so, you and I have authority, and we are going to wrestle, which is like in a, in a contest, a spiritual contest, against these evil spirits. God's given you authority, and he wants you to use the means that he's given you the weapons of warfare and use that authority to conquer the enemies in your life. Where we have authority to bind and loose. We see over in Matthew chapter 16, in verse 19, he says this, I give unto the keys, keys are means of access, of the kingdom, that's the rule and the reign, it says, of heaven. Unfortunately, the King James and most all the modern, modern translations have not correct, correctly translated this because the word heaven is plural in the Greek. Young's literal that we always put up here because it's probably the finest, especially New Testament translation that I know of. He corrects the error. It's plural in all cases. Heavens, heavens, and heavens. You can see the last one, heavens, here. And we can even show you this in the Greek. You may not know Greek, but you're going to see this. This is Scrivener's. Scrivener's is the morphology of the Greek for the King James Version. When we look through here, here's the first word for heavens when I put it over. Notice it happens to be a plural, plural word. Heavens is the way it would be translated. And here's the next one down here. Again, this is another dative masculine plural. And here's the last one, plural as well. Why didn't they translate it correctly? Who knows? Makes a big difference. You and I have the keys of the rule and the reign of the heavens. Where is these evil spirits operating? In the heavens. It means you have authority from earth, the keys of ruling and reigning in the heavens, and you can speak words, commanding words, that can take effect on spirits in the heavens. Whatsoever you shall bind. Now, this is, if you, this is also conditional upon you doing it. It's not going to happen automatically. The reason is because this is a subjunctive mood. The way you would really translate this correctly is whatever you might bind, if you do it, on earth, that's where you are, shall be, that's the main verb, shall be, it'll happen. The word bound is not a, this is not a helper verb for bound. The word bound is a participle in the Greek. And you may not know a lot of this, and you say, well, but what, I don't know, it's all this Greek stuff. It's important to understand, and we tell you about this. A participle 
means having been bound. That's why Young's correctly translates it, having been bound. Whatsoever you might bind upon earth shall be, having been bound in the heavens. God's going to, his authority is going to be released, but it's got to come from you here on earth to affect what's going on up there. You're going to speak it forth. Bind means to tie up, means you can stop all the works of these spirits. That's why you hear us binding these spirits all the time. We're stopping their works. And whatsoever thou shalt loose or untie on earth shall be, having been loosed again in the heavens. You and I have authority. We've got to use that authority, though. If we don't use that authority, are we going to stop the works of the enemy? No. You and I are to wrestle against these principalities, power, rule, authorities, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places, and stop their works. And what else are we supposed to do? We're supposed to cast out the demons, as we saw already in Mark 16. The demons need to be cast out of us. That's why the first sign following the believer is, <coughs> in my name shall you cast out the demons. You're going to do this from authority. You're also going to go forth and to heal the sick and destroy the works of the enemy. We see over in James chapter 5. It's a doctrine of the church. James 5, 14. Is any sick among you? Let him call up the elders of the church. Let him pray over him, anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord, releasing the authority. The prayer of faith shall save or heal the sick. He, same word. Sozo means heal as well. as It means to heal or restore to health as well as save kind of miss it here a little bit because they translated it save. It's not talking about you being saved. It's talking about here in this case, someone who's sick being healed. The prayer of faith shall heal the sick and the Lord shall raise them up. If he's committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Or the sins he may have committed which caused his problem more literally, they'll be forgiven him. Healing is a part of the doctrine of the Lord because he's given us authority over all sickness and disease. Remember he told those disciples to go forth and cast out the demons and heal the sick? When we saw that he gave them authority, remember what it was over in Matthew chapter 10, verse 1? He said, I gave them authority against unclean spirits to cast out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Jesus did that, but also he's given us authority to do the same thing. We need to believe his word and understand authority and operate in it. God wants you to do the works of God. You're going to do the same things that he said. He said in John chapter 14, verse 12, he said, Verily, verily I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. And greater than these shall he do, because I go unto the Father. The word greater refers to in quantity, more than you look it up in some of the lexicons. It's referring to we've got a whole lifetime to do the works. Because he goes unto the Father. You and I are going to do the same works. Jesus cast out the demons. Jesus cleansed the lepers. Jesus healed the sick. Jesus even raised the dead. The body of Christ can do all these works. See, so why isn't it being done? The problem is, are we under authority? Have we cleansed ourselves out? Have we come to the place of being obedient in all things? Have we come to the place of being truly under authority and also under, uh, understanding how authority works by speaking commanding words to see God to bring things forth? That's what God wants. Now, whenever authority is in operation, by the way, it's always going to be for edification. You know, God has set the church, He set authorities in the church. But one thing for sure, people have used it for domination, for manipulation, for control. It's wrong. It's always for edification. Look what he says, for though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, we've been given authority, which the Lord has given us for edification. It's always to edify and build up, not for destruction. So you never use authority to do any destroying work in any capacity. It's always going to be for edification. Also, we see that whenever we do anything, we never charge money for the gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 18. Paul speaking about how he goes forth to preach the gospel, and he says, What is my reward then? 
Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my authority in the gospel. God's given us authority. That means anybody who is charging for anything of the gospel, deliverance, counseling, the whole works. Almost all these churches out there are charging for counseling. It's error. It is wrong. What should be supplying all, say, well, I've got to pay the guy. Well, all the tithes and offerings come in the church. Then if you, have the, if you have the means to have a counselor on staff, then from all the money you can pay that guy. Otherwise, you know, most times, though, the pastor will do a lot of the counseling, or people in the church will all help to do all the counseling and so forth. But anybody that charges for deliverance, and we see a lot of people in this town, unfortunately, that are charging money for deliverance, it's wrong. It is sin. They have no reward. They abuse their authority in the gospel. God does not want that. He wants us to operate in authority. And we've got to do things God's way. We've got to do things that are right. God has put us in a position of authority. As one who's in authority, you can carry out the works of the Lord. You can destroy every work of the enemy. You can cast out every spirit. You can see God bring forth everything that he purposes in your life. He wants us to operate in authority. We've got to be faithful. Over in Luke chapter 19, in verse 17, Luke 19, verse 17, Jesus said, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little, have authority over ten cities. You'll be having authority over all these, these, these cities. There's two Greek words here. This is exousia down below here. That means if you and I are servants and are faithful to use the authority is given to us now in working out our salvation, getting cleansed, getting free, getting, walking in victory, and also in ministering to others, then we're going to be given authority over ten cities in the life to come. That's pretty good means we better be operating in authority now and working out our own salvation. We better be cleaning up. We better be operating in authority as a servant. And he's given us everyone to its own work. Remember, we all have our own work. We need to carry it out. Look what it says in Revelation chapter 2 as well. Revelation 2, chapter 26. He that overcomes and keeps my work unto the end, I will give him authority, exousia, over the nations. What's the conditions? You've got to overcome, conquer, carry off the victory. That's what it means. You're to conquer and carry off the victory. That's what he expects. And this isn't just for a moment. This is continuously, present tense. God wants you conquering and carrying off the victory in every area of life. And he will accomplish it as you do what his word says. He's delegated this authority to you. You now can use that authority through the name of Jesus. And you can speak commanding words and do the things that God says, and he will bring forth a victory in your life. You'll conquer and carry off a victory. And also keeps my works to the end. He pays attention. He observes them. He does the works. We've got to do the works of the Lord. You can't be doing your own thing. You are a workman for him. You're to be a servant of the Lord. You're a soldier in the army of the Lord. The guy who's a soldier in the army of the Lord, he, he doesn't get him caught up with all the affairs of this life. No. You're to walk the walk of the Lord. You want to get authority over the nations? It's not going to happen unless you conquer and carry out the victory and keep his works unto the end. Uh, I think I better get myself in line if you're not doing this thing. Hey, this is the big picture, isn't it? This life's a short time, a vapor. This is training for raining. Hey, what am I doing, wasting my time with all this worldly stuff and all this hay, wood, and stubble's going to all be burnt up? We need to get in line. Come under authority. Operate in authority. Don't let anything run you. You don't let the flesh run you. It's a body of death. You don't let the soul run you. The spirit's the way you walk after. When your mind gets renewed to it, with your mind you serve the law of God. You can't, serve, can't walk in the flesh ever, or you're going to serve the law of sin and see all kinds of destruction. You will come under his authority, you keep his works. God's going to give you authority over the nations. That's tremendous. Same time, 
you must understand. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10. He said, I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation, strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the authority of his Christ. The word of power is ecstasy again, authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Satan still operates as accuser of the brethren, but he's going to be destroyed. He's going to be cast down. He's going to be eliminated. The authority of Christ is going to manifest and destroy this. We see in Revelation 11, verse 15, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. That means he's going to conquer them all. We see the fact that Jesus is going to rule and he is going to reign. We also must realize that the authority is in the hands of the Father. In fact, it even says over here in Acts 1, 7, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons. I'm talking about when Jesus comes back the second time, as far as specifically, which the Father hath put in his own authority, exousia. The Father has the authority. He knows. He's the one who is directing all of these things. We see that after Jesus, of course, he's been delegated this, given this kingdom at this point in time. But after he has completed his work, what's he going to do? He's going to give it back into the Father. 1 Corinthians 15, 27, Then comes the end, then shall he have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the fa to, to kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. Jesus is going to put down all rule and all authority and power, and they're going to be put under his foot. Well, how's he working? He's working through you and me. He wants you and I to rise up and do this. So you and I are his vessels to destroy all these works. You must understand that God is raising up a remnant who are going to engage in walking in his ways, are going to be under authority and operating in authority, are going to be the vessels that God's going to do his works through because he's delegated authority to you and to me. And we're going to operate in that authority. We've got to be right with God. Quite a scripture here. In Revelation chapter 20, remember, things are set by spiritual law. Revelation 20, verse 6, 6, verse 6 says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. Ah, oh, those are the ones that have conquered and overcome are with the Lord. On such the second death has no authority. Exousia. See, if you're not in the first resurrection, you're in trouble because the second death has authority over you. But they shall be priests of God and Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. That's why we want to rule and reign now so we can rule and reign in the life to come. Praise God. God wants you to walk in his ways and be under authority. Revelation 22, verse 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments. The word do is present tense. Not that I just did them a little bit. No. It's consistency. Present tense in the Greek, which means continuous, ongoing action. Blessed are they that are doing His commandments. The King James says that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates in the city. The word right is actually the word exousia, which means authority. Those who are doing the commandments, and in the Greek, the way this is, their word order is a little bit different from the way that King James has done it. Because Young's brings it out really clear. Happy or blessed are those doing his commands that the authority shall be theirs unto the tree of life. That's the way you'd read it in the Greek. The authority, because there isn't a word for have. Have is a mistake. It's a to be verb. That's why it's translated correctly by Young shall be. You say, boy, you're tearing these translations up. I'm just trying to bring truth. We just want truth. That's all. And if they're not right, we've got to declare what's not right. And we're not against anybody. We're only for one thing, for truth. Blessed are those who are doing his commands. The authority shall be theirs. You do what he says, you will have that authority to the tree of life. If not, you won't. And by the gates they may enter into the city. That's that city of Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem. Praise God. We're going to be with the Lord. 
Why? Because we're going to do his commandments. We're going to walk in his ways. We're going to do, our, do his commandments. That means we're under authority. See, we've got to understand spiritual authority. Many Christians think, oh, the thor God's given me the authority of the devil. I'll just can't do, destroy all the works of the devil and everything will be fine. And they never get their life right under authority. You've got to be under authority and working out your salvation and destroying the works of the enemy and becoming a vessel of honor by doing what he says so we can accomplish that work, always obeying in the fear of the Lord, so that you'll be sanctified. You'll be a vessel that's use, usable of the Lord, prepared into every good work, carrying out the things that God has for you. See, we've got to be under authority, and then we're going to be able to operate in authority. We submit ourselves to God first, then we're going to take authority over the devil and resist him. If you're trying to take authority over the enemy and we're really not cleaned up and submitting ourselves to God and not really dealing with ourselves and living unto him, there's a problem. The more you get cleaned up, the more you get free, the more you get set, you're walking in God's ways and you get filled up with the things of God, the more you're going to operate in effectiveness in the authority that God has given to you and operate in the kingdom. God has put us in this position and God is wanting us to rise up and to take our rightful place. The body of Christ has to come under spiritual authority. God wants every one of us to come under spiritual authority to God. Be submissive to all that he says. It means you don't walk in your own ways any longer. You put the word first place. You do all the things that he says to do. You're going to walk uprightly before him. You're going to be submissive unto God. You're going to do everything that he says. You're going to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And you are, you are, I understand, i got authority over my own will. So you can never say, the devil made me do it. The devil influenced you, but you yielded and chose to do what we did. If we make the right choice, then we're going to choose the way of the Lord. And we're going to see God manifest himself greatly. Say this, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the word of God that reveals spiritual authority. I understand. It's a delegated authority given unto me that I am going beyond myself, operating in his authority in the name of Jesus, according to the word of God. And that just as Jesus did nothing of himself, he did everything, having been given authority from heaven, in like manner, I do nothing of myself. Everything that I do is from authority given me from heaven as I obey his word. I will put the word of God first place in my life. I submit myself to authority, not only of the word of God, but also to the laws. I will not violate any laws or I will be lawless. I will walk in line with spiritual authority, being a doer of the word. I will work out my own salvation. I will take the authority given unto me and conquer the enemy in all areas of life. I will conquer sin. I will conquer the works of the enemy. I will cast out the devils. I will minister healing to the sick. I will be a vessel for the Lord because I have been given authority and a work to do. I am his servant. I'm going to go forth and I am going to serve the Lord. I thank you, Lord, because I am submissive unto you and because I'm working out my salvation, always obeying in all things, being right with you, and I will operate under authority and I will be in authority and I will speak commanding words, speaking your word to bring forth all that you purpose into manifestation in my life. I thank you, Lord. I am submissive to spiritual authority. And because I'm under it, I will operate in it. I thank you, Lord, that I will always be aware 
but I'm not going to do anything of myself. I'm only going to do what the Lord tells me to do because I'm submissive to his authority. And he's operating in me and through me. Thank you, Lord, for understanding spiritual authority. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. If the whole body of Christ would come under understanding spiritual authority, they'd clean up everything. You wouldn't have any more strife. You wouldn't have any more anger. You wouldn't have bitterness and resentment and unforgiveness. You wouldn't have any more of any of this evil stuff, getting involved in lustful things, anything that's contrary to the word. We wouldn't be out there in the ways of the world. We'd be walking the ways of the Lord. We'd be speaking his word, doing what he says, serving the Lord, carrying out what he wants. He will have a remnant that will be under spiritual authority and operating it, that will do the things that God calls them to do. And they will be mighty in these last days. Tonight we're going to talk about walking in that spiritual authority and putting it in operation. And we'll be going through many scriptures tonight that show how we're going to put this authority in operation and we're going to see the authority go forth and accomplish the mighty works of the Lord. Father, we thank you and praise you for all you brought forth. Thank you for the understanding of spiritual authority and every one of us are going to be submissive to it. We will walk in it we will see the mighty work of the Lord accomplished in us and through us. Thank you, Father, for all that you accomplish as we make sure that we walk in your authority by doing your commandments. And as we see here, so we have authority to the tree of life. Thank you, Father, for the great work you're doing in each one's life. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.